Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly for stories for this week. But first, this segment is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit Tenable.com for more information. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. Welcome back, everyone. We want to start off by talking about Oracle. I and mean, I didn't, for whatever reason, totally miss this story. I got, I got back from the conferences, and this story broke, what, on Monday? Uh, Oracle's CSO came out and said, please don't hack us anymore, which, when anytime you say that now, people just hack you more. <laughs> um, well, she wasn't so nice. She actually called us, the security guys were a bunch of weenies, but... <laughs> Who's this now? Is this Allison, what's her name? Yeah, the CSO. If, yeah. if, if you look at her uh, previous blog post, um, I have to say, um, the lady is a screwless, to be honest, <laughs> when you start You're reading not... all of her uh, previous blog posts. What's her, what's her name? No, I can't remember. What's her name? I just find it kind of funny. Oh, no, uh, when, uh, when Mary, people... Mary Ann Davidson. Yeah, we've talked about her on the show before. And there's yeah, you well, know, well, a lot of well, people with a lot of opinions about her. Mostly not, yeah, when she mentioned good. that um, what researchers are giving them in terms of vulnerabilities only equals to a 3% of the vulnerabilities that they have themselves found internally, I'm going like, damn, you guys, every time you come out with a, one of your update packages for all of the Oracle products, uh, those are huge. And every time I look through them, almost all of them are from the uh, give credit to external resources. So that means that that's only 3%. So that that's how vulnerable your software is. So what does that mean? They're, they're silently fixing everything else? Yeah, that, that, that's what she's implying. Right. Because every time I look at what they're patching, a lot of it it's, comes from external sources. And she's saying that only 3% comes from internal, uh, external sources. So yeah. Um, it was quickly pulled. In fact, a lot of people actually, including myself, had, had the theory of, uh, no, what actually happened was probably they got hacked and somebody's kind of trolling them and, and put all of that crap there in, the, in a blog post just to make it funny. And no, she actually wrote it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, they pulled it down, but everyone like already wrote about it. Like there's articles in Forbes and it's too late. Do you remember, I, I, Paul? You're old enough, like me, to remember when Larry Ellison actually came out and say, "Yes, um, Oracle's unbreakable." And you remember what ha <laughs> uh, we remember what happened right after that. I, I, I imagine that right now there has to be so many pissed off researchers out there, just going through the code, looking for payback, doing an eye for an eye. You called us weenies. You said this. You said that. Oh, just you wait. You just kind of uh, drank some gasoline and then pissed on the campfire. So <laughs> I bet that we're going to see some interesting stuff in the next couple of weeks coming out. Yeah, but I mean, Larry's probably still chilling on his yacht or cruise ship. Or He owns like a cruise ship. Doesn't oh. he own like one of the most expensive? Yeah, he actually, owns? yep. And he actually owns a, a boat racing team also. Right, that's right. So it doesn't seem to affect him anymore. I think he's doing all right. I think he's doing pretty good for himself. <laughs> I mean, he's got like the world's most yeah. expensive privately owned yacht. So, hey, it's uh, vendor locking. It actually works. I mean, he can really tout himself. I mean, when you got like two helicopter pads on your yacht, that's when you know you're really, you're really. And he's always coming out of buildings with a blonde on each on each arm and everything. Right. I've well, that's why he has like the two those. helicopter pads so they can arrive separately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we address the hard-hitting news here <laughs> the hard-hitting news well and I, I guess my point with that whole story is that people are still going to buy and use oracle despite all no matter it's almost like no matter how many security vulnerabilities we find as a community people are still going to buy and use oracle yeah because, because you're, on oracle, you're on oracle you're not going anywhere yeah. else 
if you if you try to migrate away from it, it's a complete nightmare. Right. right now, one of the main reasons that Java is so popular in attacks is simply because a lot of people are tied in to specific API calls of Java for their Oracle product, and mm -hmm. they're going like, I don't have the millions of dollars to upgrade to the newest version of the Oracle product. Yep. And if and I it, this old one only works with this specific version of Java, so I still need to run it in my environment. And eventually, they will make budget and upgrade Oracle, and Oracle will get more money, despite the hundreds and because hundreds and thousands of vulnerabilities we find in Oracle. Oh, and, and, and I have to say, I have friends who are Oracle admins, and they tell me the nightmares of how it is to actually patch patch that yeah. that, that, that crappy software, and they're telling me, dude, uh, patches, full backup. You try to apply the patch. Anything goes wrong, you do a full restore. That's the only way to be sure that stuff will work. And you're like, damn, that's that has to suck. And he's like, ah, you have no idea. What I find just so absolutely interesting about this story is that this isn't about vulnerabilities at all. This is about reverse engineering and the potential of of uh, looking at intellectual property. And that an organization today that is. Uh, so well known, and as many organizations move towards bug bounties or other types of disclosure methodologies that are safer for the organization to, to outright say, we don't want to hear from you and we will sue you if you keep looking at our source code is uh, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah that, and she actually that, says that bug bounties are, uh, are a festering problem in the industry. I think that's what I find most interesting about it as well, is that you have this massive ocean moving in one direction, or whatever, the Mississippi River moving in one direction, which is openness, transparency, bug bounties. And then you have this blog post that is diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it comes from the past, basically, saying closed, don't look, we don't want your opinion. It's just startling. And the funny thing is that even though she's a CSO, she has no security background. As w w when you read her profile, she comes from a finance uh, background. So, what were you saying, uh, Carlos? That she, she was she the one that was saying that the bug bounties are the problem and they're they're atrocious. Got they're not. She mentioned that that bug bounties is one of the problems also in the industry that they don't see any value in those that people should actually focus on finding flaws internally. Well, a lot of indie, a, a lot of companies out there don't have the budget, and if she's making that statement, um, I think she's falling flat on her face because a lot of stuff is being found externally on their own products. So that means that her um, <coughs> argument doesn't have any base. Yeah, and my, well, and I agree with you, Carlos. I think it's interesting that uh, organizations will. I mean, if they, if you have the budget, if you have, let's say you have your own software company, right, and you have the budget to go hire one, two, or three engineers at a really good salary, are you going to hire them to create software, or are you going to hire them to break software? Whereas you can turn around and do a bug bounty if you're a company like Facebook or Yahoo or United Airlines, and say, you know what? Turn it out to the masses. We'll come up with a formal program and let everyone basically hack our website, tell us how you did it, and we'll go fix those problems. Because even if you have one, two, three, ten people internally focused on finding security vulnerabilities, it's still less resources than the entire internet looking for vulnerabilities. Yeah, and, and people are always going to be looking at vulnerabilities. People are always going to be poking inside and seeing what they can find. So um, kind of building that bridge to those people or a part of those people to mm -hmm. be actually able to give you that information and you having that relationship with them, it's a lot safer than them just finding that information, going, oh, Oracle's going to screw me, so let me make it completely public mm -hmm. or let me sell it. Right. I was just yeah. going to go down that same path, Carlos. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think it's a matter of fostering goodwill versus rejecting and spurning goodwill. Like if you have someone who's on the fence, they find something good, and they're thinking about what is my relationship with this organization, and right now this is what everyone is thinking. So it's like I'm not sure people are going to want to you know, participate or cooperate with something like that. Yeah, and the, the bug bounty programs are a great way 
uh, to do that, you know, because if I find a vulnerability and the company has a bug bounty program and they pay out a significant amount, you know, I'm probably, I think more, I like to think I'm optimistic, right? I think more often than not, most people are going to want to do the right thing and be like, you know what, I'm going to tell them about this vulnerability. I'm going to get paid for it and all's well. If you don't have that bug bounty program, the person who finds the vulnerability is in a conundrum, right? Uh, if I disclose it, they could sue me because they don't have a bug bounty program, so I could get sued, and that would be bad. I can hold it for myself and just, you know, use it for my own nefarious purposes, or I can go sell it to someone else, and that someone else may or may not disclose it, either intentionally or unintentionally. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to try and make a profit on it. So I think for all of those reasons and more is why companies now are embracing uh, bug bounties and why... Uh, Oracle is way behind the times when it when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's a larger social issue, right? I mean, it's it's all about how you interact with people. If you have someone who is sitting on a bug, and let's say they're young and they're feisty and they're about to do something rash, right? They can either get on Twitter with a screenshot and like scream at the top of their lungs at look look how stupid this company is. But if that's your friend's company or someone who you care about or respect then you're discouraged from doing that. You have a relationship, even if it's not direct, that says you will in turn get backlash by being rude about it if that org is open and transparent. If they're widely known for saying, hey, look, we're not perfect. If you see anything, let me know. And you come out and you try to embarrass them, like you're going to look bad. But in this case, um, people are going to think they just deserve it. I think people are not hearing us in the stream. I'm, I just saw somebody tweet that. Okay. We'll, we'll look into that. <clears throat> cool. Um, where do we want to go next? Apparently, Russian hackers breached the Pentagon while all of us were at Black Hat and DEF CON. <laughs> you think, that, you think I, that was timed appropriately or um, just coincidence? Probably. Just, I think probably coincidence, probably not. What, what I find funny is, as, as I was looking at the news and Twitter feeds, everybody going like, "Oh, the Russians, they're, they're hacking our system." I'm like, "Come on, dude, we're doing the same shit to them." Absolutely. And we're, and, and if we're not doing it, somebody needs to get fired, mm. uh, or so, uh, or somebody's ass needs to go on a fire. Uh, I, I would say we should be ashamed that. We were not able to detect it as quickly. That's the main problem. Not that the Russians did it, right? But why didn't we detect this sooner? It's, yeah. it's also important to note that the if you start reading the other articles about this, I'm not sure if the the one that's linked says it, but this attack happened about a month ago, and uh, I find it really interesting that generally around DefCon you'll see a lot of these kind of breach notifications go out that uh, just get lost within the DEF CON fray of, of news. Oh, so that's an even better... Yeah, I like your theory better, Kevin. I like your uh, theory better. Very good. Very sharp. I like it. Uh, speaking of uh, people getting fired, Ubiquity had an email spoofing fraud. What happened with the... the so there was a phishing attack against Ubiquity, and they got people to transfer funds from Ubiquity's uh, bank accounts to other bank accounts, and they lost $46.7 million. That's a pretty successful fish. Uh, and the <coughs> someone got fired there. There was a Hong Kong office in um, <coughs> Ubiquity that uh, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, SEC filing notes that Ubiquity's chief accounting officer has resigned in an interim replacement appointed. So uh, clearly things are not going so well over at Ubiquity which is unfortunate because they make really awesome wireless gear. Yeah. But yeah. now... I've actually been looking at it. Yeah. Uh, as my daughters get older, when my wife gets more technological, I have to say my wireless network here at home with two, two access points, it's actually feeling this strain of YouTube, uh, Hulu, and everything uh, put together in, into those. Yeah, you need to go with the three access point system that I recommend, Carlos, from Ubiquity. Mm. Put them on 1, 6, and 11. You'll be rocking and rolling because I feel the, the, the stress in my house of, of the network just getting crushed with 
everyone. One that we got the alert from Netflix. They're like, mm-hmm. uh, there's too many different people watching Netflix, so you need to either <laughs> give us more money or knock it off, right? I'm like, <laughs> really? I'm like, this is what, like, whatever happened to talking to each other, right? Like, we need to plan a camping trip with no Wi-Fi. My, my, my sons freak out if there's no Wi-Fi. They're like, what? What do you mean? There's, there's no, is there Wi-Fi at the hotel? There has to be Wi-Fi at the hotel, Daddy. Oh, my oldest is like that. Uh, the bill from AT&T when we're out kind of roaming around is astonishing. Uh, she consumes five gigs in less than one week if wow. there's How no does she Wi-Fi. How that? <laughs> Dude, YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. There's no control in yeah. the quality of the videos of YouTube. It's true. If in I Netflix, put it on Netflix, I, yeah. I can control it. Right, I control like it for it, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and YouTube. Five it. gigs. Yeah, Amazon. I have to try too. pretty hard to get five gigs. Amazon and That's Hulu, dude, I and, think, are, are harder. And to everything's control. Minecraft videos. She can. Yes. She plays Minecraft on the Xbox, watching Minecraft videos. She <laughs> plays Minecraft on the Mac, <laughs> watching Minecraft videos. She's prepping to go to sleep, watching Minecraft, Minecraft videos video. on the Apple TV. Minecraft is big, dude. Big, oh. big with kids that that age. Gotta upgrade your bandwidth. Um, let's see. What else we want to talk about? Kevin, let's talk about a couple of your stories. You had some good stories in there. All right. Yeah. Lenovo. Yeah. I want to talk about. So we have, we have one commonality here. Lenovo back in the news again. Again, basically the same thing as last time, but just a different (laughs) piece of crap. Did you call it crapware? Yeah. I I think my title is called crapware. Your title had crapware and it's better than my title. I was actually surprised. It it is from an attacker's perspective. That is a great persistent method. It is. For getting persistence in a box. Like you're using the uh, low jack features of Windows to have the machine actually inject code and run it and install it as a system in your box. Now, it, it is important to note this is a Windows 8 and 10 feature. It's not Lenovo specific. It just seems that Lenovo is the only one that actually utilized it and ah, is now being called out. Okay. That's a good point. So how, uh, so how does the attack – is the the – Malware comes down as an update for the tracking services of your Lenovo laptop. Essentially, it, it's it's a it, the, their software is run at, at boot time, and uh, which so anything that take that service over, you, it's it's done. Oh, Game over. I, interesting. I I can see researchers trying to find a way on how to inject code into yeah. that into that process. So when you yeah. would have it installed. Uh, I have to say, I, I really feel bad for Lenovo. I was actually thinking of purchasing an, uh, one of their Ultrabooks, the X1, and I'm go- now I'm going like, huh, I think I'll probably go with the Dell XPS 13. Yeah, I have I have a Lenovo. Is it the Yoga? Lenovo makes the Yoga, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a Lenovo. It's my son's, uh, my seven-year-old's Lenovo Yoga, and he hasn't been using it because he, he I, I can't blame him. He doesn't like Windows 8. I can't say that I blame him. He's like, give me a tennis. Nice. Give me an iPad or a Mac, and that's exactly what I'm doing with his laptop. Carlos is I'm putting Windows 10 on it. So, um, yeah. I, I'm hoping. Right now, in my case, is that I, right now I uh, I use a Mac primarily, but uh, more than half of my time is v- living in a Windows VM. Right. So right now, I'm kind of thinking like I probably should get a Windows system just for all of my Windows development, in addition to my Mac for the other stuff. Got to watch out for that Windows 10 privacy stuff. That's cr- crazy. Yeah, there was a uh, story. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's interesting, especially considering that a lot of people that are actually, uh, I was looking at the Twitter feed of people complaining about it. And when I was looking at their um, user string for what they were posting, they were using Android on uh, Twitter on Android. And I'm going like, um, you know that it captures even more. <laughs> data than yeah. what Windows 10 is actually using. And also, the, there was kind of a play with words on the data that is being gathered and how it's being used, and people were taking specific snippets. It, it was a very nice social engineering type of thing uh, and um, to get clicks, especially grabbing the uh, terms of service from OneDrive that needs access to your files it needs to look into your file so they can do the, du- the duplication. They, if, if they're forced by law, they need to give your OneDrive data to the cops and then say, no, this applies to your entire machine. No, no, no. It applies to your data that you're syncing to the cloud to OneDrive. Yeah. It is the same 
thing that happens if you put it in Dropbox. It's the same thing that happens if you put it in Box or any of the other cloud services. Um, I, but yeah, yeah. It, 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 they're they're grabbing a lot of info, but at the same time, is well, you're getting Cortana. Cortana needs access to that kind of data to use that uh, to to be able to provide you info from your calendar, from your meetings, from your weather. It needs your location. So um, there's a trade-off there, but I, my opinion on it is that they didn't have to go so overboard in terms of how, how much data they're collecting uh, by default. And a lot of that stuff should have been like, hey, here's this feature. Do you want to enable it? Yes, I want to enable it. Oh, by the way, we need this permission, so we are going to capture this to be able to to provide this for you. Okay, let me go through the list. Okay, let me approve it. Instead of yeah. just having everything on by default. Yeah, I think the other piece of that was um, there was actually an option to disable tracking. And um, a lot of people chose that option and then still did the sniffing and found out it was still going out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th th there's some data going out. Um, there's a service you can actually disable or delete if you want that that will stop that. There's a, uh, a service that provides telemetry in terms of um, system device data, what it's the computer name, OS, version, serial number, and some other data that is going out. Uh, Kevin, you had something in here about the NSA's espionage tools for the rest of us. Ah, uh, yes. I, I thought it was important to link this as I saw uh, this gentleman's talk, uh, Mike Lossman, at, the, at DEF CON. And uh, the NSA playset is a, a project that he helped start where upon the, the NSA's um, uh, TAO catalog, their uh, tailored access devices, uh, the small hardware-based devices for covert uh, uh, compromise and analysis and surveillance. Once that was released, he started the NSA Playset project, which is actually to reverse engineer these devices and uh, uh, open source them. And uh, so he presented at Black Hat and DEF CON, and I thought it was just a really interesting article that our Seneca interviewed him to, to kind of put this out in the public of seeing what some of these devices actually look like in the real world and what it took for researchers to go through and start reverse engineering them. And it's, it's definitely worth a, a click just to see what some of these devices are and, and just how unbelievably cool they are. And, and cool also absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and by cool, I mean terrifying. Yeah, yeah. so the, the presentation I saw he give was uh, at DEF CON was a device that was a, uh, a JTAG adapter. And you can imagine what you can do with JTAG and what he was able to do is essentially uh, dump memory and then overwrite it. And so you have a permanent uh, device that could, every time the computer booted, be able to overwrite memory to inject, say, uh, give me everything. So uh, lots more car hacking as well. Uh, Sammy Campcar, who we had on the show uh, mm -hmm. just before we went out to DEF CON, he hinted at this, too, but he didn't say it. He hinted towards it. Uh, so not only GM cars, but BMW and Mercedes uh, are also vulnerable to the OnStar uh, hack. They, on, they, he called OnStar was the tool that he created. OnStar. OnStar. And this one's you got to be in physical proximity of the car, right? You do have to be in physical proximity, unlike the, the Charlie Miller uh, hack on, on right. the, the Jeep. But the, this thing is, is just so unbelievably neat for, for what it's doing. A hundred bucks, and you just replay. You're in the car. <coughs> that is awesome. awesome. It is awesome and frightening at the same time. <laughs> yeah, again, there there is some again. kind of you know the parallel of a really cool and yes. man, that's that's really bad. And apparently, the other big news this week was uh, speaking of cars that you can hack a Corvette with a text message. Yes. Did you see this talk? No, I, I missed this one. Please. I, well, me. So I didn't read the article other than the title. So you got me on <laughs> well, that. There one. you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you said you were getting a Corvette. Wasn't that how you got it? I would love oh. to get yeah a Corvette. Maybe now it's a little more in my reach. <laughs> um. Oh, so this is, uh, uh, it looks to be uh, a bunch ODB2. of researchers out of the University of California. So they had a device you'd actually plug into the o uh, OBD port. And OBD2 that would download. allow it. Right. Yeah, that would allow you to SMS it, which would then interface with the local CAN bus and, and uh, be able remotely, to remotely uh, control functionality of the car. Like remotely applying the brakes. 
So that's that's awesome. <clears throat> so that's how terrifying. your Yugo is able to win in a race against the Corvette all the time. All the time. That's awesome. Um, Man, I, I ran across some other very interesting yeah, stories ahead, of this week. Uh, uh, one of the more interesting ones that I saw was the uh, uh, someone in South Africa who was able to social engineer and get a letter of authority from the South African government to go and buy uh, what we would know as an IMSI catcher or an IMESI catcher and then using that to uh, intercept phone calls of uh, people of influence or, or money and then blackmail them. So what this article is talking about is them targeting specific people in uh, places of power to blackmail them into uh, what seems to be assigning very large government contracts in a certain way. That's and that's, <laughs> that's fascinating. It is fascinating. It's, again, absolutely terrifying. <laughs> hey, so this reminds me of another story. Um, so someone just uncovered a campaign where hackers were breaking in and were stealing. They weren't touching anything else. They were going after PR releases. Yeah, there's were, the next story I was talking about. Oh, yeah. Very, so based on very the similar. PR release, absolutely very similar. And what I like about it is it's not a hack where you look for things and then you try to sell it. It is a business model where hacking is just this sm small portion of it. So it's actually stock manipulation, you know, um, that's kicked off by getting the information that you need, which is the press releases. And so uh, the, the article I, I linked to specifically about this is that they uh, recently arrested 32 people involved in this ring, and they're being charged with over $100 million in insider trading. So they were using this, this kind of uh, uh, just hacked press releases, you know, the, the corporate earn er earnings reports that haven't been released to the public yet so effectively that they were able to draw $100 million out of it. And that... that yep. Yeah, just the power of something so so what you wouldn't think is is uh, in the you know PR releases you see these things every single day, but yep. uh, yeah they're very time sensitive uh, obviously in this case which is interesting yeah yeah <clears throat> and probably phishing attacks or Lenovo malware or Oracle software or hey any of the number of vulnerabilities we talked about in this show that led to those uh, news uh, you know I'm sure you can. Uh, probably pretty easily target the people who would likely have these documents on their computers or have access to these documents with a little bit of research. Um, and that's how they were just profiling and, and ripping this data before it was released. Well, they're going right after the PR firms themselves, the ones who... Oh, okay. uh, so uh, hack the who, PR firm, they're going to distribute it yep. because they have an advanced copy of it. Yeah, so there's several services out there that will handle these the, the yeah. dissemination of PR releases, and they just went right after them because wow. they had the documents ahead of time. That's awesome. This is fascinating. I mean, think about a larger campaign where you're just, you're inside of companies themselves and you're not doing anything drastic and more like a cuckoo's egg attack where you're subtly manipulating stocks mm -hmm. because you're in like hundreds of different companies, but you're just one step ahead of everyone else in terms of buying and selling. You're giving us evil thoughts, Daniel. That's putting, that's putting <laughs> your, your, your Mike Poor signature evil hat on. Or Ed, Ed Scotus and Mike Poor used to talk, talk about the evil hat. It's putting your <laughs> evil hat on, Daniel. I like it. Um, well, that uh, was there any other stories you want to talk about, Kevin? You had a list there. Uh, I had a list. Well, There's really not much else all that interesting in my list. Uh, I mean, at this point, I think we've all heard about stage fright, the, the Android vulnerability. Yes. Uh, that affects literally every device possibly out there. What I find more interesting is that they patched it and the patch didn't work. <laughs> so the, the article I linked to <laughs> was actually uh, uh, them looking at the patch and seeing, hey, it didn't patch everything, and then going full disclosure on it and saying, this is how you actually get around this, and then releasing a next patch. So this happened, I believe, today or, or yeah, I think today. They, they they released saying it that the stage fright is still out there. Yeah, it was Exodus Intel who actually. Yeah, uh, Exodus Intel. Yeah, yeah. So that. Yep. Welcome um, back. Welcome back to the game. To yeah, we, we, and and this comes back to what we were discussing with IoT, like how do we patch all of these devices? Right. In the case of Android, it is so fragmented, and then you have the carriers. You actually have control if you get the update or not and then you have the vendors that say no we're only going to patch the newest and greatest and the previous version and that only covers probably a year two years of phones 
and if you have had your phone for over those two years, you're screwed. And, and um, lucky, this was just for phones. Can you imagine if it was for tablets too, Carlos? Yeah, uh, 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 no, and, and one of the safeties right now, one of the things that people are saying, oh, we're happy didn't impact us because we're so fragmented that they would have to tailor it for a specific platform and go like, ah. Uh. No. So that means that if, uh, if I go Samsung uh, and I go, let's say, uh, S4, S5, and S6, probably I'm going to cover quite a large gamut of people. Yes. Also, and. Android gives its information in its user agent. So the only thing I need to do is send you an email, send something where I can get you to click and me getting that user agent and go like, okay, he has an S6. Now I can tailor my exploit to you. Right. So hmm. that fragmentation will probably protect you from uh, worm spreading, but it won't protect you from uh, targeted attacks mm -hmm. or from yeah, somebody I, actually having a collection. Yeah, I feel like this whole thing is just making walled gardens look a lot more attractive. You mean like then again, one of the reasons that iOS is so secure is that it is just so difficult just to use Apple tooling to get to the binary and reverse engineer it and dealing with the signatures and jailbreaking. It's, and a lot of the tooling that you have for Android is not there in iOS. So right now, one of the biggest advances iOS has, not only its wall garden, by having better control in the App Store and having a better update procedure, is that a lot of its inner workings and stuff is just so obscure and lacking proper tooling that it's just too hard uh, to actually reverse engineer and find vulnerabilities. Well, absolutely. Plus, I, I see those as the same, right? I see I see that being a simple word. I see everything there, walled garden included, as a matter of control. They say, you do it our way. Yeah. They're doing the same stuff with HomeKit. They're saying, you do it our way or you don't get to participate. And people don't like it, but, but they do like the experience and they do like the security outcomes. And also you have the other, um, I would say, problem in the case of iOS is that if you're able to get one of those exploits that can be used for jailbreak, you won't be selling it. You won't be telling Apple. You will be selling it to one of the uh, Chinese uh, guys that actually make those packages for jailbreaking your device. And you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars hmm. if you find these exploits. So these exploits do not go to Apple to be patched. They're found and you'll see them in the jailbreak kits. So there's a different market that from the case of Android. Oh, I found mm -hmm. a with in Android. Um, yeah, what are you going to do? Get root? There's several ways of getting root. So, right, right. Uh, so, so there's like two different ecosystems, even for the exploits and how they're going to be used uh, by somebody. And it actually affects IoT. IoT right now we have one problem is that we don't have a, w a way for updating stuff. In Black Hat, I think, or DEF CON, they had a pay, uh, they had a presentation on Zigbee, how Zigbee can be attacked yep. and you can be part of that mesh network and be able to control that entire mesh network. And then when you go like, huh, right now all of my Zigbee devices, none of them have an interface for me to upgrade their firmware. Hmm. None of them have a way for me to actually even see what version of firmware they're, they're running. They are just, uh, I have uh, one, two, three. Um, sensors, there are Zigbee sensors, there are temperature sensors, and they don't have a USB port, they don't have a JTAG, they have no way of being, being able to update those. Thankfully, the rest of my network is C-Wave, but who knows if next year the next attack is C-Wave. Yep. I, I have the same stuff in my house, Carlos. Uh... Well, I think that rounds out the stories for this week. I want to thank our fantastic uh, panel. Daniel, thank you for uh, sticking around and helping us with the, the stories of the week. Of course, Kevin and Carlos, thanks as always. And we will see everyone next week on Security Weekly. Over and out.